do. Uh, Father God, may my words be your words. May your truth seek deep into our hearts. May your spirit use this for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. I remember reading years ago about a conference in the UK on comparative religions. And there was this question that was put out, well, what's the distinctive thing about Christianity? People said, oh, maybe it's the incarnation, Christ, the God becoming man. But others said, well, no, there's, there's other religions where there's myths of various things, like in Hinduism, for example. Um, the four-armed handily named Vishnu that comes in 19 different incantations of part man, part fish, tortoise, lion, and other characters. It's not the incarnation. That's, there's similar things out there. Some said maybe it's the resurrection. But others said, no, there's, there's other religions that have resurrection-like ideas or mythologies. Things like in Egypt, Osiris or Dionysus, the pagan son of Zeus. And it was that moment that C.S. Lewis walked in the room. We've recently finished reading Narnia to the kids and, and looking through some of those things. And he asked in his Oxford voice, what's, what's this all rumpus about? What, what are you fighting about? And they told him, and he said, oh, it's easy. The distinctive thing about Christianity is grace. It's what we're talking about this morning. Now, in our, house, in our household, on the 31st of October, we have a special family celebration. And before Don hits the um, trap door button, it's not what you're thinking. It, it, it's not Halloween. Although, Halloween is the one day of the year where people do come to your door to accept Bible tracts along with chocolate. And so... Like, there's, that, that's the sort of thing that the milky bars and, and the tracks are a great time to, to share God's love and light with the dark world. Um, but it's not that. It's, it's also Reformation Day, celebrating just over 500 years ago a really great event, a, a light dawning, being able to see the truth from God's word. One way that can be summed up a lot of the, the things that happened at Reformation uh, in, through the Reformation of the five solas, or the five alones. Um, those solas are, we're saved, it's all about salvation, we're saved through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. And if you're astute in counting, you would have seen that I only said four. That's because the last one, which is actually the first one, is that we're saved by grace alone. We're saved by grace alone. Now, the word grace is used in many different ways. We have a niece called grace. Grace could be used to describe some sort of a ballerina that does all sorts of lovely movements. It's never described for me in that way, though. Uh, it's, it's also something that we sometimes use to describe what we say thanks to God at the dinner table, saying thank you for our food. But those things are quite different to God's grace. And that's what we'll be talking about this morning. So if we, we define grace as defined in the Bible, what we're talking about is the word charis, grace. It's God's unmerited favour. What does that mean? Let's break it down. Firstly, it comes from God. It's God's unmerited favour, not ours. But it's to us. Secondly, it's unmerited it's unearned, undeserved, unwarranted. We can, we can never say to God, you owe me something. You owe me your love. You owe me your grace. It's unmerited. And thirdly, it's good. The, the thing that we actually merit is God's anger on our sin, his judgment on our sin. Our sin merits that. His grace is unmerited. This favour, this love, this peace that he's brought, is transforming. It's good. And surely that's worth finding out more about. As we look at our passage, let's look at three specific characteristics of grace. Firstly, grace gives life. Secondly, that grace is priceless and free. And thirdly, that grace transforms lives for God's work. So firstly, grace gives us life. Did you see in verse 1... Let's turn to it. 
It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And it goes on to talk about that we're made alive in God. We're made alive in Christ. That's over in verse 5. He's made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Now, this might be one of those things that you read this passage and think, what does it mean? It's a bit odd, isn't it? Uh, Are all these people zombies walking around? Uh, If someone was a a non-Christian reading this or listening to this, they might think, are we really dead? I'm walking around, I'm breathing. Actually, I'm probably having more fun than a lot of these Christians. I can do what I want. It doesn't matter. There's no consequences. Christians can't have fun. Maybe they're the ones that are dead. In one sense, they're just a little bit right. In Romans 6.11, it tells us that we count ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. But look at the opposite. Look at the flip side. This verse tells us that we we were dead in sin and dead to God. Now, we're still dead to sin, but we're alive to God. We're alive in Christ. There's this spiritual Revival that's happened in our hearts that's made us alive to God. Now, maybe you've been a Christian for ages. Maybe you've believed this, um, this, these scriptures for ages and understood for ages, and you start to forget how much we need God's grace. You start to forget what that former life may have been. Or maybe you've, you've grown up in the church and you've just remembered that all your life through. Maybe doubts start to creep in. Maybe you start to think, Was I really that bad? Did I really need God's grace? Was I really that deserving of of God's punishment, God's wrath? Maybe there's others this applies to a lot more than what it applies to me. In the last couple of years, I've been reading the Bible with uh, a colleague that he started off saying, well, I, I believe in Jesus, I love Jesus, but I don't know that I'm going to heaven. I don't know that, I don't have any assurance that God's forgiven me. I don't know if I've done enough. I'm not sure if I'm good enough for God. I'm not sure if I'm good enough for heaven. In fact, I'm probably not. And in reading through Galatians and reading through Romans with him, it's it's turned some light bulbs on in his mind and in his heart. And let me share one of the verses from uh, Romans 5.10 that has really been one of those light bulb moments. It said, for for if while we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? He started to see that our salvation is not based on what we have done. It's based on what God's done, making us alive in Christ. It didn't say, for while we were still God's friends, while we were still friendly with God, having a great time with God, it said, while we're still God's enemies, while we're still rebelling against God, God's taking initiative, God's done the thing, God's poured out grace, God's saved. If you need a refresher of it, have a read through Ephesians, have a read through Galatians, have a read through Romans. And even if you don't need a refresher, have a read through Ephesians, have a read through Galatians, have a read through Romans. See God's grace in action. Martin Luther, who was the one that um, in many ways kicked off that Reformation by nailing the thesis to the wall just over 500 years ago, said, on man's part, nothing precedes grace but rebellion against grace. It's not that we're almost there And then grace has just kicked us over the line and helped us out and made us become alive. It was that we were God's enemies. We needed his grace. One of his friends, Philip Melanthon, said, the only thing we contribute to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. So offensive, isn't it? But sometimes we need to be offended. Sometimes we need to realize, actually not just sometimes, All the time, as soon as we start falling into a pattern of thinking, yeah, I'm saved by what I've done. I'm good enough for God. We need scripture to show us that we're not good enough for God. Because we could go through 
each of the, the commandments that God gives us. And Jesus actually did this. Do you remember the time of the rich young ruler where he came up to Jesus and he said, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to go to heaven? And Jesus said, well, you keep the commandments. And he said, oh, I've kept all of them. It's all good. And then Jesus put his finger on the first one. He said, give all your money away and follow me. And what was the response? Sadness, because he had broken that first one. That first one of love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And yet what did he love more? He loved money. Money was his God. Money was his idol. And who of us can say that we love the Lord our God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength? The greatest commandment, the first commandment. And yet we don't. We need God's grace. His law shows us that we need his grace. It turns us back to him in saying, God, save me. I need your grace. And thank you. Because any life apart from that is effectively a death sentence. We're walking in rebellion against him day after day after day. So this new life in Christ, being alive in Christ, this regeneration, as it were, it transforms us. It makes us spiritually alive. It gives us a new master, not that master of sin and death and the devil, but a new master, a master who's Christ, the Father, a new and living hope, and really a reason to actually live, a purpose in life, something that changes us. God's word's clear that people are dead, but as Christians we're made alive to worship and love God. So... God's grace gives, brings us life. How grateful are you for life in Christ? Our second point was grace is God's, is God's priceless and free gift. Now, when we hear the word free, sometimes that raises a bit of suspicion, doesn't it? You might get those calls that I sometimes do. Do you want free whatever it is? Uh, free holiday, free solar, free Wi-Fi, free um, something for your electricity metering and things like that. And you think, what's the catch? Surely there's a catch. There's something here. They want my time, my money, my data, my information, whatever it may be. Or maybe more. Maybe it's just a complete scam and they just want all your money. I don't know if you've seen the movie Father of the Bride. There's father trying to plan his daughter's wedding that's getting bigger than Ben-Hur. And there's one point where his wife comes in and says, honey, great news, the church is free. And he exclaims, finally, something is free. And she says, oh, no, honey, I mean available. <laughs> We're a bit suspect of free, aren't we? Well, we can be. Um, when I was a student doing my undergrad degree, I was, I was having a chat with someone about the gospel and he just could never get past this aspect of God's free gift, God's grace that's poured out. He said, but that's not fair. It's not. It's not fair, is it? But it's what God's done. He said, I should take the responsibility for myself if I've done the wrong thing, and I probably have. I should take the responsibility myself. But what are the consequences of doing so? They're, they're dire and disastrous, and yet God's done something. I think sometimes reflecting on the Christian faith and what God's done, sometimes it doesn't make sense. That is, if it was something that man just made up, if it was something that were our own invention. Because, seriously, what God would do what ours has done. What God would die for his enemies, for those that hated him to redeem them to himself. What God would send his son to die for these traitors. And yet what's God done? He has. Remember that verse we saw earlier on? While we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. His grace is one of those free things that is actually free. But at the same time, it's priceless and costly to him. He's done everything for us. What should our response be? 
How could we be ever more thankful than what he's done? One aspect that's almost universal, if you look at any other religion, is that the concept of earning your salvation somehow by pleasing some god or deity by some means. It might be good works, alms, chants, prayers, niceness, pilgrimages, and many other things as well. The common thing about them all is what I've done. I've prayed, I've given, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've earned my God's favour. But anything that we try and add to grace really cheapens it. If we say our salvation is by grace plus a certain number of prayers per day, ritualistic giving, um, reading the Bible every day, uh, attending church three times a week, whatever it may be, it's not to say those things are bad. Actually, reading the Bible every day renews our minds and God says that's a great thing. Giving is something that we should be doing. but We're not saved by that. And we shouldn't ever trick ourselves into thinking, I'm saved because of, yeah, God's grace, but look at what I've done. Look at what I've done to secure my spot in heaven. Those things are good things, but they're not what saves us. Did you see it in verse 8 and 9 of the passage? Let me read it. For it's by God's grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. There's going to be no one in heaven that's going to be boasting, I was good enough to be here. Do you know the only boast that we can have on that day? Christ was good enough and that's why I'm here. Christ is the one that's showered us with his grace and that's why I'm here. It really cheapens God's gift if we start thinking down that route. Christ's death was good enough. Well, actually, it was almost good enough. But it needs all the stuff that I can add to it to get me over the line. One thing that stood out to me when I was reading Galatians with my friend was the very last verse in Galatians chapter 2. It said, I don't nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law then Christ died for no purpose. If we could live a good enough life and secure our salvation through the law, i.e. by the things we're doing and by the good works, there wasn't any reason for Christ to die. But because he did, it shows we can't. We can't save ourselves. We can't get ourselves over that line. It's his grace. Remember, we were dead in sin, and God's reached out to us in his grace. It's one of those few things in life that are actually free and priceless and worth everything. In verse 4, it tells us that he's rich in mercy because of his great love. This was his motivation to do so. So how do we take hold of that free gift? Well, we don't have to spend time on the phone holding for someone from a different country to answer our questions and things like that. We don't need to hand over our credit card details. We need to turn to God, who's always there and always listening. We need to repent and admit that we need God's salvation. We need to turn from our sin and apologize for it. But then we need to turn to him in faith, trusting in what he's done to save us, not thinking we've worked our way into heaven, not thinking we've worked our way into his favour, but recognising that Jesus has saved us. Now finally, grace transforms our lives for God's work. Now that we're brought to the topic of works, did you notice verses 9 and 10 said something really interesting about this? Let me read it out. Uh, It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, For we're God's workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're saved by grace, not works, but for works. We're saved by God's grace, not by works, but for works. 
compare the first half of this chapter and the last half of this chapter, there's works happening in both of them. At the start, it talks about the way we used to live. We followed the ways of the world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is at work in those who are disobedient. But now we've got good works flowing out from God living in us, from God redeeming us and transforming us, because now we're in Christ. So why should we do good things then? We don't do them to earn our salvation, to earn a ticket to heaven. We don't earn them to try and pay God back out of guilt to try and say, well, thank you for saving me, but let me earn a bit of my salvation back. Verses 9 and 10 tell us what those good works are. They're a consequence of living in Christ. They're a consequence of being joined to him. They're a consequence of being transformed by him and made alive by him. They're the cart that follows the horse, the trailer that's pulled by the car, not the other way around. We do them for the glory of God, not for the glory of us. These works don't save us. They're a consequence, a pattern of living after trusting in Christ, after walking with him, listening to him. He changes us. He changes our wills, our desires, What we want, our passions are altered by him. The mere fact that we're breathing shows us that we're physically alive. I wonder if you've ever watched a movie where there's someone playing dead and they're lying very still, but if you look really carefully, you can see their chest going up and down slowly as they try and make their breathing nice and slow. But they're still breathing. They don't pay dead actors who are actually dead. The fact that their breathing's a dead giveaway, that they're, they're not actually dead, isn't it? If we're a Christian, if we're growing in Christ, the fact that we're doing these good works should be a dead giveaway that we're a Christian, that we're trusting in him, that we're growing in him. Not that we're trying to earn our way into heaven by doing God's good things, but a natural consequence of being touched by God's grace, being changed and transformed by God's grace. So... Are you doing good? I hope you are. But are you doing good because you're trying to earn God's salvation? Or are you doing good because you love God? Because he's saved you and transformed you and he's made you alive. Grace is a key ingredient in how God reaches down and saves us. People that are rebelling against him. People who are his enemies, as Romans 5 puts it. It isn't simply a a an interesting theological concept, something that's out there and a bit esoteric and weird and hard to understand. It's a distinctive thing about Christianity. It's instead of a religious person working their way up to God, working their way into God's favour, it's God reaching down to us, unmerited favour, unearned, undeserved, that he's poured out on us. Many people invent different ways to try and make themselves right by God, but none of them work. Grace is how God's made us right before him. He reaches out and touches people, not because they deserve it. We certainly don't, but because he wanted to, because he's poured on us such gracious love and mercy. And this is essentially the heart of the gospel, that God made everything the people, the universe, all that exists. And what do we do? Well, we take the the option to, to rebel against him. Our forefathers, the first people did it, but we do it every day as well. It's a characteristic of the human race. We see then God moving to restore that relationship through the perfect life and death and resurrection of his son. And then there's a question that weighs on each of us. How do we respond to him? Grace is its foundations in the cross, in redemption, in a costly, costly above all costly loves that he's shown. It happened when the perfect God, 2,000 odd years ago, reached out to corrupt people, you and I, and extended life to them. 
And you know what? That offer wasn't just for one day 2,000 years ago. It's for every day since and today. It's available today, but it might not be available tomorrow. 180-odd thousand people die every day. 67 million people die each year. We don't know how much time we've got left. But today, today is a day to trust in Christ and every day after it because his grace has been poured out to us. It reaches down, takes away our sin and welcomes us into his family. So today, if you're not trusting in Christ, if you think you've maybe you're good enough for heaven, you're not. I'm not. No one is. Actually, that's wrong, isn't it? There's one that is. Christ. And that one brought all of us along with him that trust in him, that trust in his perfect righteousness. So if you're in that boat, have a chat to a pastor, have a chat to someone that you know trusts in Christ. And please don't ignore or reject his grace. But if you are following Jesus, and I think most of you probably are, I hope this fresh look at God's grace has been something that stirred something within you in thankfulness, in joy, in giving glory to God for the great thing that he's done. And maybe reminding us that, well, that this isn't a secret. This isn't something that we keep to ourselves and don't tell anyone about. Who else in your life needs to hear about God's message of grace? Who else needs to hear about this gift that's bestowed to us, graciously given? So let's remember that God's grace gives us life. God's grace is priceless and yet a free gift. And that God's grace transforms us for his work. Will you pray with me now? (laughs) Father God, It's astounding to us that you would pour out such a generous gift on your enemies. It's astounding that you have given and delivered this grace to us. Thank you. Lord, may our hearts be full of thankfulness each and every day for your amazing and costly love shown by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.